So this how-to series is to teach us how to stay in step with God, and especially if we knew what to do and when to do it, it would certainly help. Would you say amen on that? Not only that, but we're going to learn too that when we're reading through Scripture, when you see the big S on the word spirit, it's talking about the divine Holy Spirit. When you see the little word S on the word spirit, that's your spirit or evil spirits or spirit of infirmity or whatever. You follow what I'm saying? So the big S, capital, divine, little S, your spirit. Can you say amen? So go with me to John chapter 3. Look at 1 through 9. We're going to talk about a fella who was a doctor of the law, who was a teacher of, of Jews, who was supposed to know the oracles of God and yet did not understand what it meant to truly be born again and what it truly meant to be saved. John chapter 3. Does everybody know what a Pharisee is? They're the ones that added to the law. In fact, Paul the Apostle was a Pharisee before he got converted. He was the elite of the elite, studied under Gamaliel. So he was like the top of the line hitman for the Pharisees. So they believed in angels, the resurrection. So they believed in the supernatural, okay? But then there were the group called the Sadducees. And those were your realists, your scientists. And they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in any of that stuff. And neither one of those guys could get along. So here we go. This guy was a doctor of the Pharisees who believed in angels, who believed in supernatural things, right? Look what he says. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs uh, that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is what? Born again, he cannot see. See the word see? Put a little underline there if you want to in your Bible. It means to perceive. It means to understand. It says, unless you're born again, you cannot understand. Does that clear it up for you a little bit? You cannot understand the kingdom of God. Doesn't that match up with 1 Corinthians 2, where it says the natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit? Why? Because to them it seems foolish. Right? <clears throat> well, let's read on. Okay, and he said, now, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Now, is Nicodemus thinking spiritual things here? He's thinking what? Physical things, right? And he's a leader of the Jews. What is he supposed to be teaching? Spiritual things. And yet he says, well, Jesus, I don't understand. How, how can a grown man crawl up his mother's womb? Duh. Wouldn't you say that's a big duh? I would say. Okay. All right, <clears throat> Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a, a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, listen carefully. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Enter what? What do we know about the kingdom of God? Anybody want to answer that? What is the kingdom of God? Tell me. Make it simple. What? God, Spirit, Jesus. Yeah. <coughs> it's all that, but the kingdom of God is a package of God that he gives. Okay? The kingdom of God is something you and I inherit when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, which is Jesus, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost, right? So the kingdom of God will resist flesh. Say that with me. The kingdom of God will resist the flesh. So when Nicodemus says, how can I crawl back up into my mother's womb? And Jesus says, hey, look what he said. Most assuredly, I say, 
Unless one is born of water and born of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, what does that say? Now, who wasn't born of water? Who wasn't born of the Spirit? Satan, right? So, what can't he enter? No, the kingdom of heaven. We already know he got thrown out of heaven. But where's the kingdom of heaven now? No, you got to get these pieces together. That's why I'm not trying to get on your case. I'm just trying to show you without understanding these pieces, the Bible's not going to come together for you. The kingdom came at Pentecost, remember? But it locks out all religious flesh. Satan can't enter the kingdom. You and I, if we're in the flesh and we're not born again, we can't enter the kingdom because the only ones that qualify to the enter the kingdom are two. You've got two qualifications. Being born of what? Water. And being born of the what? Spirit. So what is born of water? It isn't being baptized because in baptism you're not born. When you're born in water, what does it represent? You got to get this. It's important. Natural birth. You see, Satan wasn't born here. He stole his authority from Adam. But God said, the only ones that have real authority in the earth are the ones that are born in the earth. That's why we know that God came and in the likeness of Jesus and had to be born in the earth. And when he was born, did he come out of his mother's womb? Jesus, did he? Yes. Come on, you guys. Bible, 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 Bible. Get in the Bible. Yes, he did. That's okay. I'm not trying to pick on you. Really, I'm not. But we need to know these answers. Yes, he had to be born in the earth. Can you tell me why? It says it right there. Why did Jesus have to be born in the earth? Now, I'm not going to call on you because I don't want you to feel like I'm on the spot. Why did Jesus have to be born in the earth? you got to know this. Because he couldn't save us unless he was. God cannot die. You cannot kill God. He had to take on a body so he could carry it to the cross with our sins and our sicknesses. You understand? And when he said on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, God separated from the man Jesus Christ. And the man Jesus Christ, his flesh died, but his spirit and soul went into hell and preached to the captives and told the devil, look out, pal, in three days I'm going to kick your butt. Now that's carry prayer phrased. But that's what he, that's what he did, right? So we actually get born again in victory. That's why when, when Jesus said you must be born naturally from water, there's people that will argue this point. They think the water there means you have to be baptized in water. Let me ask you, what happened to the thief in the cross? Was he baptized in water? So evidently, you can't have scripture contradicting scripture. So evidently, it means something more than than being baptized in water. And I believe all of us should be baptized in water. But to go to heaven, the only one that's required is being born again or baptized into the body. Another word for baptism into the body is being born again. Okay? By one spirit, we're baptized into one body, even by the spirit of God. And when Christ shall come, he will put you in the body, or excuse me, Holy Spirit will put you in the body and Christ will put you into the fire, into the Holy Spirit. Mystery of godliness. Okay. So, he says, what's born of the water, okay, cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, we got that. What's the kingdom of God? It is the place where the king's kids dwell. No one else. So, guess what? Devil can't follow you into the kingdom. So, what does he do? It gets you to be fleshly all day. Or tries, right? Because <coughs> he knows, <coughs> sorry, that if we're fleshly, we can't just enter the kingdom when we want to. That's why Pastor Kerry heard from God and started teaching years ago, meet with God first thing in the morning so you won't have to worry about being fleshy. Sounds good, doesn't it? 
All right, let's read on further. So it goes on further. It says, uh, it says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. See, he clarifies, water, flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. Then he says something really strange. And I'd like you guys to respond to it if you would. The wind blows where it lists it, and you can hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes, where it goes. So is every man or woman born of the Spirit. What does that mean? Think about it for a minute. Apply it to what we've learned so far. This is how we study. We apply it to, we have to be spiritual. We're talking about walking in the Spirit. So what's he talking about? The wind blowing and where it, you can hear it, but you can't really tell where it's coming and going. What's he talking about? He's an, talking about the analogy of how the Holy Spirit is supposed to guide you and I. You see, if we list out everything we're going to do for the day and don't give room for God, Satan can read that list and he'll pick you off. Hello? So we want to be led and we want to walk by the Spirit of God. Why? Because we become like the wind. He cannot predict what God wants to do with us next. Now we know we have certain things that we do. We get up in the morning, we, we shave, brush our teeth, we go through those routines. But, but I'm not talking about that. Satan thinks, okay, well, I'll just keep that person quiet and sitting down. Yet, at any time, you could hear God and go see somebody or give somebody a call or move in a certain direction. Very, very important. Why? Well, think about how many times Christians have stepped into a trap or they said something they wish they didn't or they operated in an area maybe they wish they had a little bit more help. I think we all fit that description. But the Bible says when we walk in the Spirit, He minimizes those problems. And everybody should say at this moment, Amen! Amen. If anybody needs minimization of problems, I do. Yes. Can you say Amen. <laughs> All right, so we read John 3. Let's go down to John 10 in your Bible. Go to John 10, verse 1. Just give you a clarification with this scripture. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, remember we showed you that picture on a Sunday of the sheepfold? And the shepherd was sitting in the doorway. Do you still see that picture in your mind? Can you still imagine? Yeah. It says, I say to you that he does not enter in through the shepherd of the sheep or through the door, but climbs up some other way is the same as a thief and robber. Now this is what we call in the Bible the law of two references. Everyone say two references. Two references. Because this entryway deals with natural birth and spiritual birth. This particular one deals with natural birth. Now, in order for Jesus to die for our sins, how did he have to be born? Naturally. Yet his birth, there was no sex involved because the curse of Adam is passed through the male. So there was no sex involved. So therefore the Holy Spirit and the word of God, like a seed in her womb, the Holy Spirit built the seed in her womb and the blood and the spirit all came from the father and the nourishment came from the mother. But there was no curse passed on from Joseph. Immaculate conception. Perfect birth. Can you say amen? But he still had to be born in the earth for legality purposes. For legality purposes. We must be born again because of legality purposes. We cannot be good enough to go to heaven. How many know that we can't be good enough to go to heaven? But you're good people, aren't you? Well, why can't you get to heaven by being good? You're not entering in by the door. You're not entering in by faith. 
You're entering on by works, being good, and you can't do it. Remember, God rejected Cain, his sacrifice, because it was the works of his hands. You're all good people. We all do good things. But God's looking for our spirit, looking for our faith. He's looking for our love and adoration. Can you say amen? He's not looking for our buck teeth and our crossed eyes and our selfish flesh. And I'm talking about me when I say that. Did you know I used to have cross eyes? I didn't. I'm just joking with you. <laughs> but you think about it. We're all kind of walking around like we're lost. You know what I mean? And then we get saved. And then our life changes. Isn't it wonderful? So you have to come in by the door. You guys got it? All right. Same with the kingdom. You can't enter that kingdom in the flesh. You got to go in through Jesus. Can you say amen? That means you got to meet with him before you go in. <coughs> Let me put it this way. You got to meet with him at the time you go in. Not just meet with him once and now you have access. No, because you flush over periodically. And so if you're meeting with God in the morning every day, then you're ready to go in at any time. Can you say amen? amen. What does it say? Come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain grace in a time of need. Amen. And the way we do that is because we've met up with God. We talk with God. We're friends with God. So there isn't any hesitance about going in and getting what you need. God said, come on, I will supply all of your need, right? All right, John 14, look at verse 5. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except what? Now, some translations use the word by, but I believe the old King James is better. It uses the word through. When you go through that door, you're not going in by the door only. You're going in by the door, through the door. You see, and so even a small word can alter our conception a little bit. How many know that we approach the Father through Jesus, not just by Jesus? Because you'll have people say, have we not this done this in your name? Have we not done this in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? And God says, depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So the name could be used, but it isn't the name only. It's the spirit. Remember the, the seven sons of Shiva? We adjure you. We cast you out by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the spirit says, Paul, we know. And Jesus, we know. But you, uh -uh. and they beat him up and chased him out. Yes, One demon beat up seven guys. Don't mess with the devil unless you know who you are in God. All right, our point is, there is no other way to be saved than to accept Jesus Christ. There's a salvation, right? 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16 says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they seem foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually revealed. But he who is of the Spirit judges all things, and he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we all have the mind of Christ. Where is the mind of Christ at? <coughs> <clears throat> Boy, that singing is good. Look at your Bible. There's the mind of Christ. Everybody look at your heart. Pull it out of your chest and stare at it. Right in your spirit. There's the mind of Christ, right? Doesn't God live in there? Now, think about it. If God lives in your spirit, do you teach your spirit anything? If God lives in your spirit, can you teach your spirit anything? No. no. Can you teach God anything? No. no. And if he lives in your spirit, you can't teach your spirit anything. So stop looking as you've got to feed your spirit. No, you've got to straighten your head out. 
Your spirit already got God in it, doesn't it? Yes. So your spirit doesn't need straightening out. It's the coupler. You know that you know, and I'm getting excited about this. You have a spirit, but it has to flow through how you think. Even though we go to the Father through Jesus, Jesus has to go through your thinking. And if you're not thinking very well, you're going to hinder him. Bible says in, in Peter that if you have, and I'm just using this as an example about hindrance. But when a husband and wife have arguments and they don't resolve it, it says your prayers are hindered. Okay? <clears throat> Anytime that we're odds and our minds discoupled, thinking about other things, I mean, just think about it. Your mind's focused on going to church and everything. You get into church and now it's on hamburgers. Now it's about what so-and-so said. You're not focusing and concentrating on the word. You got to realize something. Now, I'm saying this because I asked my pastor, how does it work, pastor? And my pastor says, well, God gives me the sermon and he gives me it because he read all of your hearts all week long. So he gave me exactly what you need to hear. Now, if you're not in the position of hearing it, then you're going to miss one of the steps of your growth by not paying attention. And then he sat down and he told us four or five more times that very thing that same day. And he says, now, do you get it? Do you get it now? We didn't. We didn't. Because we didn't put any value on the word like we should have. We can take it or not. What up? Nah, nah. We don't study it. We don't go after it. And God's standing there going, listen, didn't I tell you in the beginning was the word? The word was with God. The word was God. So if you don't pay any mind to God in the word, then why are you calling yourself a Christian? Might as well call yourself a big bumble. Hello? So it all proves out. We're here because we love God. We want to understand how things work in God. But at the same time, it's very important that we understand that everything's set up for God and for us, for us to operate in the spirit realm, not in the physical realm. The best we can be as physical beings <coughs> is being religious. You know, when we're overly thankful and overly apologetic and religious about certain things, we do that because we want people to know that we are real grateful, right? But how many know that if we do that just within our physical flesh, we, we kind of can become obnoxious? Hello. But when we do it, even if we do something that's not, not, maybe not so cool in the spirit, it's just blessed. Because the difference between the energy of the spirit, energy of the flesh. Can you say amen? So it says, it goes on, it says, but, but we have the mind of Christ. So a couple of points. There's only one way, not many ways. How many know one way to heaven? Okay. No, the scripture says that how with the temptation that you're tempted by, God will not give you the way of of escape, right? He didn't say a way of escape. Some translations actually use a way. When he says, and you're in something over your head, God will give you the way of escape. And so, who is the way of escape? Jesus, Jesus Christ. So, out of any temptation, any problem, anything that you're having, our way out is who? Jesus. Yeah. So we need to learn to walk in the spirit, to walk in God, right? So let's say we need to do something and we need to get a project done, but boy, we're running low on time. Lord, so you go and you pray and say, Lord, I need you to order my steps so I can get all this done in a, in a timely manner. And next thing you know, you're stepping everything out. Why? Because you ask God to help guide your steps by the Spirit. Not you trying to figure out. You think about a lot of things. Some people will sit down to do a project, but they won't think about it four or five times before they start doing it. 
You see, they have a plan. They sit down and they start doing it. Then they forgot the hammer over here and the nails are over there. And now they got to get down and up the ladder because they didn't set themselves up. Same in the kitchen. If you don't do any prep work, you're going to sweat yourself to death behind a, a fiery stove. You've got to prepare. You've got to think things through. Say amen. And that's what walking in the Spirit affords us. It affords us the grace of thinking things through and asking God to help step us through life. Amen. All right. And you're the ones. Second of all, the car, you know, needs gas or needs fuel, right? You need God to run on every day. Listen, you're repenting and being a, a good person last week at the altar. That was good. That was wonderful. The crying, the weeping, that's great. But that's not gas for enough but one or two days. You got to meet with God every day because you've got a thief stealing your and siphoning your fuel. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, how many here have a certain amount of things that go through at the day? They're not always positive. Every time you do, there's a little drain on your fuel. Every time there's a challenge, somebody calls you a name. Every time that you can't quite finish your homework, you're, you're, you're struggling. It's a drain on your fuel. Hello. Now, God doesn't leave you, but the spiritual glistening of God's spark will begin to grow dim if we don't keep the fuel up. Can you say amen? And the word is fuel for the fire of God. So if you don't chuck your wood in there, chuck the word in you every day, that fire will just go down to a pilot light. I'll stop there for a minute. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, God never leaves you, never forsakes you. But the fire can dim. Well, how does it do that? When you take the lead. Now, do you understand what I mean when, when I say we take the lead? I mean, I, I, don't want, I don't want you to think that I'm picking on anybody. But when we take the lead, that means that we forbid, we forget about asking God about it. We just sort of leap out on our own. Now, sometimes that'll work. But how many has ever had it not work? Amen. So wouldn't it be better to walk in the Spirit? I remember when I started first teaching, pray about everything. So I'd have a brother or sister come up to me and say, well, how about this? God knows what I'm going to do here. Why should I have to pray about it? And I said, because when you pray about it, he might have a timing for you. He might tell you a little more detail about it. He might say, wait. Hello. And the person says, ah, no, I can figure that out. Guess what happened a week later? I guess he didn't figure it out. Boy, he looked like somebody dragged him through a knot hole backwards. And you're going, what happened? We get to thinking we can glide and just do, we're just doing really good. The Bible says, he that thinketh he stands, take heed lest he fall. That's put in there to keep us in a balanced perspective about not overthinking or overestimating our own ability. Someone say amen. Now, thirdly, religion is man's attempt to reach towards God, to make God feel good, to impress God, while Christianity is God reaching towards man with his son, Jesus Christ, and says, now I'm going to watch what you do with them. Every human being will have to stand. Every human being, every generation will have to stand before God, whether they're saved or not, and give an answer to what they did with Jesus Christ. Many will say, I did this, I did this, and God says, enter into the joy of the Lord. Many says, I didn't do a whole lot, but I loved him. God will say, enter in. But many will stand up and say, well, how come I didn't get in this line? He says, well, your line is after the great tribulation. You stand with the wicked because you did nothing with Jesus. You constantly approach God on the basis of your own works. 
You see, so we have to be careful of that. Can you say amen? Or how could you say God be so mean to send somebody to hell? Never sends anybody to hell. Never sends anybody to hell. The only one he ever does and hasn't yet, and that's Lucifer. He will send him to hell. And we'll be right there going. Yeah! Can you say amen? All right, let me turn my page. Acts 4.12, listen to this one. I love this scripture. It's a good one to memorize. So nor is there any other, nor is there any, there's salvation in, excuse me, I blew that, didn't I? Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You can't say, God come in my heart in the name of Jehovah. It's not going to work. Let me ask you this. Let's see how smart you are. Who was Jehovah? Now, who's God? Here we go, Pastor Kerry. Are you referring to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Who is Jehovah? No. Jehovah is Jesus. And the reason why we know that is because Jehovah is where we get the word Lord. The Lord God. So we go Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord our provider. Okay? So we know the Father provides, but the one that brought the provision was Jesus. So he's the Jehovah names. So there's 18 to about 23 Jehovah names. Jehovah Nessi, Jehovah Sikanu, there's Jehovah um, uh, Nessi, I said that one. There's a whole bunch of them. And I got a whole list of them. When I did the names of God, there's only one name though, God the Father pays attention to. And if God the Father wants you to pay attention to that name, I think we ought to. And it isn't Jehovah. It isn't Yahweh. Now, nothing wrong with those names. Okay? It isn't uh, uh, um, whatever. It's Jesus. Well, in the Hebrew, it's Joshua. There they go again. These people want to mix all these languages up, trying to give you a better understanding. Listen, what's wrong with the word Jesus? Nobody cusses in Jehovah. Nobody cusses in, in Yahweh. But they sure use God and Jesus, don't they? Shows you the real stuff. Okay, let's go on. Listen to this. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. It talks about this woman was possessed with a spirit of div divination. Remember the girl? They got thrown in jail, remember, in Acts 16? Paul and Silas singing psalms in the middle of midnight, you know, and there was a big earthquake. But this girl, I'm just going to tell you a story. The girl kept following Paul and the group around. Now she was a fortune teller. So she would tell everybody. Everybody knew her. She'd tell everybody, these guys are just like us. They're showing you a way of salvation. And after a couple of days, Paul says, that's enough. And he rebuked the spirit. See, she said, a way of salvation. She didn't say, the way of salvation. So basically what she did was including herself in the message of the gospel. And Paul says, I had enough. He says, birds of the air find lodge into the branches of the kingdom of God. Amen. There's a lot of fowls out there that say in their Christians, but they are not. And so we know what happened, right? Okay, so we'll go on. Acts chapter 19. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Can you remember what they were? Well, if you read on, he had special handkerchiefs, didn't he? Yes. Right? Peter with his shadow, Paul with the handkerchiefs. Yes. And they would have them on his body. And he knew about the anointing. See, most people don't know about the anointing. In the New Testament, I think they're all having a party time. But the anointing can permeate. Did you know this? That the anointing can be transferred into something over and over and over again. You were with me when I said everybody speak the name of Jesus to a piece of paper and they transferred the anointing in it and then I just laid it on a couple of people and knocked them right onto the floor. Okay? 
Well, Paul knew that. It's called in impartation. You know, anointing cloths. You anoint them and you send them, right? But most Christians, they don't impart. I asked a guy the other day, well, actually, uh, six months ago, he was having demon problems in his house. I said, get the oil out and anoint your house. But he didn't do it. He still hasn't done it. And the demons have gone through and ripped the family apart. Now, come on. You do what I tell you. Not because I told you, but maybe God told me to tell you. What are pastors for, huh? <coughs> <clears throat> we're here to, for nobody to pay attention to. I'm not telling you things because I want to control you or because I think you need to know. I'm telling you things that God's telling me to tell you so you can say thank you, not to me, but to him. Amen. My goodness, you think this is my funnest time is go to teach the word so I can? No, I want you to get this. So one day I stand before God and says, you did a good job. They didn't listen to you, but you, they, you did a good job preaching the word. And that's what I want them to say. Okay? I can't get people to listen to me, but I certainly can make sure I preach the word. Right? And we can make sure we listen. Right? So I don't have a problem with you guys that way. But, you know, can you imagine having a larger congregation and just assuming everybody's listening? You know, and then you went and you had your ushers interview them. What'd you get out of the sermon today? <laughs> Come on now. You know I'm popping you really good. You know, I love you dearly. So the idea is we have to get stuff. Now, I know this. My pastor's told me, he says, I'll continue to preach the same thing until you get it and we can move on. Amen. Hello. Good pastors do that. Amen. If they're, they're, their little sheepy is not learning to eat yet, they'll work with that one until it gets it down. Hello. Nowadays, you try to work with somebody. If they don't want you to, they'll get you down. All right. All right. Let's move on. So we can see the whole situation there. And there was, this is about the Jewish sons of Shiva. So I'm not going to read that again. We talked about that. Remember, we adjure thee. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Can anybody tell me what was wrong with that? D Denise, you want to make a stab at that? that? Why didn't, what was wrong with the sons of Sheba saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches? What was wrong with that? Um. Why did the demons beat him up? They really didn't know Jesus. They just knew that Jesus was a lucky charm. Yeah. I've got Jesus, Buddha, a star of David. I got everything around my neck. Yeah, you'll find no atheists near a foxhole. Yeah, the closer to death you are, the more religious you become. Trouble is, when we get far away from death, and we start thinking it's our own, we become like Nebuchadnezzar, and you'll end up eating like an animal in some field somewhere. Yes. Believe me, I lived on the streets for seven days. One day was enough. And then I realized, I'm just sitting around feeling sorry for myself. Got up, and it's over with. See, it's not that we fall. How many know we all fall at certain things? It's how we get up, folks. And we get up by the Spirit. Amen. We don't run our Christianity whether or not my wife tells me she loves me every day or not. Oh my gosh, my day is terrible. Why? My wife didn't even say she loved me today. You see? All right. So let's move right on past this. All right. So we can see the blessings come when we walk in the Spirit with God. Okay. What is man? Who could tell me what man is according to scripture? Now just think about it for a minute. And again, no wrong answers here. I'm not going to try to embarrass you. But you need to know man is described in scripture this way. And the reason being is so that when we are reading scripture, we can see which part of our life it applies to. Whether the flesh, the soul, or our spirit. 
Can you say man? I just told you what is man. What is man? Yeah, and you, you did it all right. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay, a lot of people do it differently, but it's those three. Amen. Now, can you tell me what those are? You want to make, try to make a stab at it? It's okay. Don't worry. And can you tell me the voice for each one? Here's another thing that we should learn in the first grade of Christianity. Is you're a spirit being. And that stopped, okay, when Adam committed high treason, became a dead spirit being, okay? But we are spirit beings. So being born from mom and dad, our entire life until the, we reach the age of accountability, we're learning everything from the physical senses, passed down from mom and dad and what we burn ourselves or not burn ourselves, we're learning from senses. But then one day we get born again, then we have to begin to learn from the word and our spirit, okay? So we are a spirit. We have a soul. What is our soul? We want to try to, anybody want to make a stab at it? Now, I'm not trying to sit here and say, I know this, but you don't. That's who we are. That, you're the individual soul, okay? There's no recycled souls. You're the only one there is. God threw the mold away. Now, there are physical likenesses in certain people. Have you ever seen somebody who looked like your brother, maybe, or acted like your mom? You know, that. But the soul is unique. That's why it says, what's a profit, man, if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? The key is to control your thinking and your soul, delve it into and baptize it into the word so that you can think in line with God who lives in you now. So your flesh can get in line. Because if your head is all messed up, then you can't do what you want to do. Paul said it this way, with my flesh I serve myself, and with my mind I want to serve God. But I find this law in my mind, the wars again in my mind, not my spirit. In my mind, the wars against my flesh. You see? So the mind has to be conditioned properly. We have mental institutes. We have people born meant with mental challenges. In fact, let me say this. I think we all have them to one degree or another mental challenge. We might not be able to notice it. <clears throat> if something comes out a little bit in old age. But we all have challenges, don't we? That's why God says, don't look at somebody else's challenge. Work on your own. He used the word moat and spec, right? All right. So what is man? Man is a spirit as a soul lives in a body. But God wants it all preserved. Can you say amen? He doesn't want you out of order. <coughs> wow. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body too. Your spirit is where God comes to live in you. He doesn't come to live in your head, nor your flesh. <clears throat> he comes to live in your spirit. All right? And if you think about it, when you hear the phrase, it's the hidden man of the heart. What's the hidden man of the heart? If that's a hidden man of the heart, what's the outer man of the heart? Is that the way you look at the word? I hope so. So what's the hidden man of the heart? Well, I'm, I mean, not really, but yeah, you kind of is. It's your spirit. Holy spirit. No, your spirit. Your heart is soul and spirit. Say, my heart, the core of my being is my spirit and soul. Not my, Not my flesh. So therefore, I shouldn't listen to it. Okay, so therefore, your heart is your personality, your soul, and your spirit to, combined. So the hidden man of the heart would be the spirit. Because it's hidden. 
But your soul's not hidden. Can you tell me why your soul isn't hidden? Because if you talk, it comes out. Because if you think, it comes out. If you do, it comes out. People can see who you are by what you do. That's why we're called a human being. Hello. Whew. College 909 on that one there. But, but basically, that's the truth. So you don't feed your spirit. You massage your spirit. You feed your soul. It says the eyes of your understanding, what? Are being enlightened. So do you get it? Now look, watch me up here. Do you get it in your head and then it drops down to your spirit? No. No. You get God in your spirit and comes up into your head. Yes. That the eyes of your understanding become enlightened. Yes. Paul talked about a time where actually scales came off his eyes. And then in the book of Acts, one time Paul rebuked a guy and scales came on his eyes. So you can only see in the light of your understanding. I'm going to say it again. You only see in the light of how you understand. So if your understanding of God is twisted and tainted, you're going to be twisted and tainted in some of your actions. You don't mean to be. Bad thinking produces bad believing. Good thinking produces good believing. If your head's all out of whack, you might as well sit down until it's right. Don't go anywhere, don't do anything. You know, I've, I, I used to sit down and say, okay, God, I need a sermon. I need a sermon and nothing will come. God says, I don't want you to seek me for a sermon. I want you to seek me from my heart. And then you'll get a billion sermons. So I just started saying, okay, Lord, you give it to me when you want. He just lays it right on out. See, since I got out of the way, God was able to help me, you know. And it's just like that. Lord, help me just get out of the way. Thirdly, your soul consists of your mind, your will, your emotions, your appetites, your intellect, and your personality. You are a living personality. Fourthly, your body is the earth suit. It's a wonderful machine. Try to make one sometime. <laughs> so you, gotta, you actually have a voice to all three of those things. Your voice to your spirit is what? Anybody tell me? Yeah, my wife says crocheting. No, no. It's, uh, it's your conscience. The voice of your spirit is your conscience. Right? The only problem is if you're not saved, your conscience is not all that pure. That's why it says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Or maybe I said it's desperately wicked, deceitful in all things. But that's Old Testament. Now who lives in your heart? And who's influencing your personality? Amen. So stop being a crab. Right? <laughs> Joking with five. We are to function as spirit beings using our soul to relate to others while our flesh carries us from place to place. Say, I got it. And then sixthly, when man fell this order fell out of line. He suddenly, instead of a spiritual light creature, became an emotional, sensual creature who gets gratification over their eyes, their ears, their flesh. Amen? That's how Satan began to tempt Adam and Eve. He tempted them, lust of the flesh, pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. God did not really say. Listen, he's withholding things from you, God is. If you eat of this tree, you're going to know good like God knows good. And you're going to know evil so you can stay away from it. But see, he lied. See, they already knew divine good, didn't they? But the good he was talking about 
was the good of being without God, good on your own. And from that point on, they didn't call on the name of the Lord till Genesis chapter 4. So Satan had him so far away. And we know by Genesis chapter 8, look what happened. So we got to realize that we can't, you know, can't be playing games. Our Christianity is a lot more serious than we think. And the disciples during Jesus' time knew all this. There was no other way to live. And that's the way they lived. And God took care of them, right? All right. Let's go on. I like this. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Who can quote it for me? Therefore, if it, huh? That's it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. New species of being. Operates different. It's a God kind of creature. Amen? Old things have passed away, and all, behold, all things have become new. Where? In your spirit. Not in your head, not in your flesh. You've got to drone out and clean out your thinking. Can you say amen? amen. <coughs> if people won't deal with their fears, that fear can show up later on and keep people bound. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, this I say to all of us, walk in the spirit. Everyone say walk. walk. Now, can anybody tell me what that word means? Just think about walking. What does walking mean? It means everywhere you go, all throughout the day, walk in the spirit. Well, how in the world can we do that? Easy. Meet with God and walk from your inside man out. And when you start getting maladjusted, stop. And say, okay, Lord, let's redo this. And then go right in again. Have you ever caught yourself ready to do something dumb? And you caught yourself and you decided not to do that? And everything was fine. You just went on. We need to catch ourselves more often. Can you say amen? What is the law? What was the law, what was the law for? And we'll finish up with this. Can you tell me about the law, anybody? Now, I'm not saying, I, saw, I kind of sound smug. I don't mean to. Well, what was the law designed to do? What does the book of Galatians say? What is the law? What, why, why was it given? To make them... Marvin, excellent. To make us aware, I mean, not even the Jew, the Jews too, especially the Jews, but also us, to make us aware that we could be breaking godly principles or sin. You're driving 70 and then suddenly you see a 35. We'll slow down, right? Well, the law was to remind us that when we start doing things on our own, thinking we're doing good, it reminds us that everything that we do within our own energy will amount to nothing. Instead, we need help from a Messiah. We need help from somebody that will help us do it properly and not do, us, do it wrong. Right, you know, if somebody would have just told me, I would have never done that. Right, right. So basically the whole idea is that the law was given to teach us that we couldn't save ourselves. And so let me tell you, did God get rid of the law? No. no. You know what? He still uses the law, doesn't he? And can I ask you, this is a little trick question, but really not. Well, who does he use the law on? No, you're a child of God. He doesn't use the law on you. He used the law on lost people, on people who think they're all that good. He reminds them how they're not by showing them the law. Yes. Now, he's not beating them with the law, but the reason why he doesn't show us the law is we're not of the flesh, but of the spirit. If Jesus Christ dwells in us, Romans 8, 11 says... 
So what does God do? He shows us the word. That's different. Now, it doesn't sound all that different, but let me explain. He shows us the word because the word gives us hope while the law condemns. See, that's the only difference. Now, the law is not bad. Neither the giving of the law bad because the, the righteous part of that is to remind us we need a savior. That's the good of it. But we as children, we get his word. And if you go to Hebrews, when it talks, uh, uh, I think it's the, the 12th chapter, when my son despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, yes. nor are, are be dismayed when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Mm -hmm. Well, he's not whacking people with the law. No, he's telling us the word so that we can say, oh, and hopefully because we love him, we will turn. What does it say? We love him because he first. Why? Tell me why, what that scripture means. It's actually pretty simple, but I, want, I had to figure it out. I mean, a long time ago, I, I loved the Lord because he first loved me. Amen. What does that mean? He showed us an example of that love. And then he says, if you accept my son, I'm going to put my love in you and I'm going to show you how that works. You see? So I love the Lord because he first loved the world, loved me, that he gave his son to me. And I return that love, not within my own strength. I return that love in my own adoration towards God but I return the love of God back to God. When we worship, that's what we're doing. We're returning God back to God and showing our respect for him. So the flesh shows respect and surrenders while our spirit delights in the Lord. You see the difference? And so if we're walking on in the flesh and don't know we're in the flesh, then you'll find it hard to raise your hands in a service or hard to get into the songs. You just kind of just sit there. Well, see, you're still being controlled by your flesh. Now, I'm not trying to put our finger on anything, but you'll see people. They're still controlled by their emotions and their flesh. They haven't really tasted all that of God yet. I can't wait till they break free and God slays them in the spirit and they wake up an hour later and they go, what happened to me? You see, we're barely touching God right now. Let's go in. Let's walk with God. Let's walk in the Spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. So, to walk in the Spirit, how do we do it? Very simple. By walking from the inside out. Did you get anything about that tonight? All right.